Hello and welcome to an extended edition, an edition of Eye on Africa uh, this Tuesday evening. I'm James Creedon. Now, it's been less than a week since Paris announced it will withdraw all of its troops from Mali. This after a 10-year campaign of assisting Bamako in a battle against Islamist separatists. But since an August 2020 uh, coup and a refusal by the ruling military junta to hold elections, relations have collapsed between the two countries. Tonight, we bring you an exclusive interview with Mali's Prime Minister Chogwell Maiga. He says that French authorities sought to divide Mali over the past decade, fanning the flames of separatism in the north of the country. He insists Bamako never requested the departure of French troops, despite a souring of diplomatic relations. Uh, Chagwell Maiga also says that the discourse of uh, French authorities left him in no doubt that France wanted to overthrow the military junta. This interview by Alain Foucault. We've got to a point where the French authorities are angry. They started insulting our authorities and their ambassador engaged in provocative activity here which divided Malians. That's why you asked them to leave? When they insultingly address our transitional president, the Malian head of state, we said it's too much, especially since we suspected that they were planning something. To overthrow you? But that was clear. You. The whole government, all the manoeuvres were made for that. All those speeches saying this illegitimate government born from two coups. We, we work with the Russian state. But President Putin says... But we don't comment on the words of other heads of state, other journalists, other commentators. We've seen cargo planes land here with brand new helicopters coming out. We have the Russian intruders who are with our officers. It's not Wagner. But we didn't hide. But it's not Wagner. The word Wagner is what the French call it. We don't know Wagner. OK, that interview there by uh, Alain Foucault with uh, the Prime Minister of Mali, uh, Chogwell, uh, Chogwell uh, Maiga. Now, we're joined in set by Cyril Payan. Good evening, Cyril. Good evening. You, were, you were in Mali three times over the last two months, so you, you really have your finger on the pulse of what has been going on there. Now, what do you make of uh, some of what was said in this interview by Mali's uh, Prime Minister, notably uh, that France is sought to help separatists in the north of the country uh, when the Barkhane mission, led by France, was expressly to snuff out separatism in the north of the country. How can we explain that point of view? Well, it's not a surprise from the very gentleman who was just saying this, uh, his, his words, because he has been spreading as a key player in the entire French sentiment in Mali uh, for the past month and to uh, aggravate the, the bad relationship between Paris and Bamako. So this is the one of the main populistic uh, uh, sentence saying that uh, France in the, in the years 2013, when they liberated part of uh, of Mali actually uh, generated some separatism and moreover, which is remain really remain to be pro proven, uh, uh, con considering the, 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 the huge military operation going on on the ground, that it actually did promote uh, 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 the, the jihadism, which but is... What, well, would, what is the logic of that? that? That just seems completely impossible to believe. Why would France promote... Uh, separate Islamist separatism in in the north of Mali. What is the, what are French interests? Where it's, would the French interests be well, in, in to doing an, that? To answer that question, this is what you can see in the streets of Bamako uh, for the past weeks: demonstrations, anti uh, Operation Barkhane, which is this, this huge anti jihadist uh, military operation, which is maybe dated and has been to be reinvented. But this is a very pan-Africanist, sovereign, sovereignist, and nationalistic, I would say, populistic mm -hmm. way of. Uh, uh, pushing with the words we are just uh, attaining, gaining the ground, the, 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 the very people in the street of Bamako. The problem is uh, the, the, the fact that the France, France is leaving Mali, um, is maybe getting some success uh, like this demonstration a few days ago in, in, uh, in, in Bamako, but this is not, not abs absolutely not the same in the, in the vast part of, the, of Mali. And I just remind the gentleman that he, the central government is actually, uh, is actually controlling less than one third of this mm. huge country. This is the biggest West African country in the region. Right, so with, with the it's capital just right down south, as far away as it could be from uh, this uh, troubled uh, region. Now, Cyril, you were reporting, one of the subjects you were reporting on was uh, Russian propaganda in Mali. Of course, this, this angle has been getting a lot of coverage, the fact that Russia might be quite present, and indeed the private security firm Wagner in uh, Mali. To what extent is Russian propaganda influencing the population, perhaps even the military junta, in terms of the point of view their point of view vis-a-vis -vis Paris's uh, intentions? 
Well, we have um, a very strong and heavy uh, information war. This is the even the French military is is is, uh, is saying that the, the Russians are so ahead of us or the Western side, I will say in in this in these terms that they are really manipulating in car in central Af in um, in Mali, sorry, and this is like Ukraine. This is a front in Africa of influence. And uh, the Russian just, just are just filling the gap like the Chinese are doing it with commerce. Because 10 years ago, François Hollande was welcomed with, 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 with Indeed. fanfare in Mali right. as, 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 you know, when France came in uh, offering that military support. And 10 years later, we're seeing that the public perception radically changed, right? And also, but the, the, the French public also doesn't really don't really understand and don't support anymore uh, this uh, war. And this is the this is the, what we say. We can start a war. The the other thing is to end the war. Right. And maybe this is also uh, something we have, to, we have to point on the on the French to maybe have been too late uh, mm. to decide to leave. Sir Payan, thank you for that. Pleasure. And now we were just talking about uh, Wagner and for several weeks now mercenaries belonging to uh, the Wagner Group have been in Mali delivering logistical support to the country's armed forces. As the eyes of the world are on Ukraine, uh, we tell you more about Russian interests in Mali in this report and what the country hopes to achieve there through the Wagner Group. It's known as Vladimir Putin's secret army. After deploying to several countries around the world, the Wagner Group has now sent hundreds of men to Mali. Despite the Kremlin officially denying any control of the group, there are well-established ties between Wagner and Moscow. The mercenaries, who are often former soldiers of the Russian army, have almost always intervened in areas that have a political interest for Russia. In Mali's case, the group is also accused of being there to protect the ruling junta. Ils arrivent au Mali avec des finalités prédatrices. Mais pourquoi Parce que la junte qui est au pouvoir au Mali après deux coups d'état considère que ce sont les meilleurs partenaires qu'ils peuvent trouver pour protéger leur propre pouvoir, pas pour lutter contre le terrorisme. But although Moscow has often denied the group is defending its geopolitical interests, Vladimir Putin himself does recognize the group has very clear economic goals. The Wagner Group has been the target of harsh allegations in the past. Several organizations like Amnesty International have accused the mercenaries of committing atrocities in a number of countries. Kenya's ambassador at the UN Security Council has condemned Russia's decision to send troops to recognize Ukraine's eastern breakaway regions as independent states. Uh, Martin Kimani drew comparisons between Africa's experience of colonialism and uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Bastien Renouy has more. Kenya's ambassador's speech to the United Nations Security Council has been acclaimed everywhere in the world and especially here in Africa. On social networks such as Twitter, people are congratulating the ambassador. Some say that it was the best speech held at the United Nations Security Council in recent years. In his address to the UNSC, Martin Kimani explained how Africa understands Ukraine and what Russia's acts mean in the post-colonial world. Listen to him. This situation echoes our history. Kenya and almost every African country was birthed by the ending of empire. Our borders were not of our own drawing. They were drawn in the distant colonial metropoles of London, Paris, and Lisbon, with no regard for the ancient nations that they cleaved apart. Today, across the border of every single African country live our countrymen with whom we share deep historical, cultural, and linguistic bonds. At independence, had we chosen to pursue states on the basis of ethnic, racial, or religious homogeneity, we would still be waging bloody wars these many decades later. Instead, we agreed that we would settle for the borders that we inherited. But we would still pursue continental, political, economic, and legal integration. Rather than form nations that looked ever backward into history with a dangerous nostalgia, we chose to look forward to a greatness none of our many nations and peoples had ever known.
Even if a conflict between Ukraine and Russia would be thousands of kilometers away from uh, Kenya, it could still be felt here in East Africa. First, uh, global oil prices would increase. It would be an issue for the world world, not only uh, Kenya, but there is a more specific issue that would uh, be a problem here in Kenya. The East African country uh, imports 75% of its wheat from Russia and Ukraine, and most of this wheat comes uh, by boat from the Black Sea. In case of a major conflict, uh, maritime transport would be blocked and price would increase. Yet, uh, wheat flour and uh, bread are very important here in Kenya, so it could have a huge impact on local economy. Bastien Renoui there in uh, Nairobi. That's all for this edition of Iron Africa. Thanks for watching. Do stay tuned.